Each Sunday night, I'd watch the practice with none of my friends. I'd turn the dial to ABC to see the creep of the week that Bobby Donald defends. But I'm out of practice. With your host, Keith Barney, and my giant forehead, apparently. <laughs> He's a five head, baby. Mike and Deglio! Way back in high school, most every night, my mom watched QVC, so I missed the practice. There was no TiVo, what could I do? Wait 15 years, get fat, then stream it on Hulu. Last night was the Super Bowl. I will not be discussing it. As CEO Jen put it, that was kind of lame. Out of practice. And welcome to the Out of Practice Podcast, the weekly podcast in which we discuss David E. Kelly's award-winning series, The Practice. This week we are up to season five. Episode 19, Home of the Brave. We are so close to the end of season five. I can't believe it. How's it going, Mike? Hey, you know, it's going. It's Monday, another week. We've had a lot of snow, and, uh, you know, it was beautiful, and we got to frolic, and, you know, that's been nice. We we had the Super Bowl last night, which means we got to eat some BS and get really fat again, which has been nice. Yeah, well, I I am so disappointed about the Super Bowl for two reasons. One, the obvious reasons. Fuck you, Tom. Uh, But (laughs) I can't believe I just did that on the internet. Uh, But beyond that, uh, because of the snow, which was so great, which was so much fun. uh, Jillian and I, we we built a giant snowman in our backyard. It was like so much fun. Uh, But because of that, I had been planning for weeks on the Super Bowl to uh, order a box of garbage uh, of like wings and uh, and mozzarella sticks and fries and just like sit and eat a box of garbage during the game. But because of the snow, like we, we I, you know, it felt like a lot, like a big ask to get somebody to come out w- with all the snow just because of the timing of it. Right, right. So I made some nachos, but I was very disappointed not to eat a box of garbage while a garbage person won his 700th Super Bowl. We did get some garbage. Jen made her dark chocolate chili and Oh, uh, your Jen's chili is dynamite. We yes. had it cuz uh, we spent last Super Bowl with you guys. That's Jen right. Jen and I we went to your house back when that was a thing. That the, feels the, like the last month of it being a thing. That feels like forever ago. Well, that's what we didn't even know. Not, neither of us knew we were moving at that point. That was February no. of last year, and everything was fine. It, literally, it was a com- and it was literally it was weeks from not being fine. And I was already st- like starting to be aware that things weren't going to be fine. At that point, I, it, Jillian was like, "Why are you hoarding food on top of the fridge?" Well, that's because I was starting to sense that it was happening, but yeah, we didn't because I remember we I was. Uh, I had like a bunch of gigs lined up and we were go we were ready to we were about to fly to South Carolina for Jen's uh big birthday party and uh right it was probably like 2 weeks later that it was like Ugh, things are a little iffy but regardless so yeah we had the big chili we also ordered from this new wings place that's near our house I wanted we had wings. a whole bunch of wings and fries which I haven't had any bad food in like weeks so it was kind of nice uh but then I started to feel like like death, uh, my inside started to turn inside out, and uh, for multiple reasons. And uh, yeah, you know what? Okay, so the Tom Brady thing aside, for for those Super Bowl that aside, Keith and I have our own. I, opinions I don't think about Tom. any of our listeners give the tiniest shit about anything to do with sports. That's the, that's, that's the true. Problem. But listen, here's the here's the important thing. As far as a pop culture event, the Super Bowl is a big thing, and it is. And I just found here's here's what I found. Um, I found that for me, the uh, the halftime performance was like, eh, I, I'm I'm not like I don't have the vitriol that I saw online about it. I also didn't like love it like some people. It was like meh to me, but that could be because I'm out of touch with the kids and their music, right? 
Um, but then on top of that, the commercials, which are generally like a huge sell, like a lot of the the big players generally uh, like sat this year out. And then you know so the, some of the big reveals, like the Wayne's World thing and the the uh, the George Costanza thing. Like I, I don't know, there wasn't anything that like really knocked it out of the park. And the mixed messaging I felt, and I don't want to get here we go with that politics. Oh, here we go. There's all this talk about unity, and they like they 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 brought. Uh, Vince Lombardi back from the dead to like pep us all up in the, in the I think stadium. it was Dan Loria too. Yeah, it was weird whatever it was. I, yeah. I did not find it inspiring. I found it creepy. Um, mm-hmm. and, but meanwhile, d- during during all of this, Colin Kaepernick is like watching the game at home, right? Because we're not going to address that. Right. And in addition, we're celebrating the greatness of this like weird MAGA guy. Well, yeah. And I... I I have been the unity 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 thing has always a little bit set my teeth on edge, and like it, it's not that I'm I, I'm 100 for unity of course for <laughs> unity yes please for the love of God let us reunify, but there is all of this rush to unity without accountability, and I don't think you can have unity without accountability, and and those two things. Are is must be are essentially tied together because it's not unity without accountability and and I and it it's tough it I I find it a little bit rough when when you don't marry those two together it because it because I think that one side of the spectrum is really pushing one without the other let's let's skip accountability let's just skip right to unity so therefore the thing that tore us apart can just come right back because there is no accountability. So well, that's my soapbox. Yeah, but le- but let me talk about how that has, it was not even, you couldn't even paint a better picture of this than we've been hearing for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks that um, they're, you know what, we're going to have 7,500 vaccinated healthcare workers that will be, you know, at the game. And the implication right. in the press, at least, what I, the way I read it, was that those would be the only people attending the game. But Super Bowl Sunday, there are 22,000 other most likely un-inoculated un- people. Yeah. So yeah. that's mixed messaging. And I have to say, as just a side anecdote, and then we can jump off this. Um, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it. It's probably come up a little bit. I spent about two years of my life living and working in Tampa. Okay, I'm I'm well versed with Tampa. Oh yeah. Um, I still have a, a handful of friends down there, uh, and I do I do not say this lightly. I'm not making light of it. Um, in fact, one of my friends lost his wife recently to COVID. It's it's a terrible, terrible thing. I think we all are on the same page about that. But three of my other friends from Tampa all on Super Bowl Sunday on the social medias announced that they were covid positive and i'm like well hell here we go it's just it's just yeah. a it's a fiery pit and uh, and it was just a weird place and time to be celebrated it just it, none of it it wasn't overall an enjoyable evening for either of us Keith. i think we can say that well, no i know and i i think it's just yeah it's mixed i i, I think you know we had mixed messaging we had all, it it with the whole thing was like uh, and, and I, I think that's just reflective of our times right now. That they're like we can't really have nice things <laughs> that aren't at least complicated, if not tainted, by the environment that we're in right now. Yeah. All so, right. all right. Well, on that cheery note, we have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about this week. In starting with our segment. I would like to start with two things. Was that Obama? Uh, or that's just sometimes you just meld seem so seamlessly into your Obama. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank a couple of our important listeners who have done amazing things. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jorge Navoa oh, once yeah. again for the uh, ridiculously complicated and uh, beautifully edited video uh, that he put up last week. Check it out uh, on our Instagram or on our Facebook. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Oh, my voice is sitting pretty low today. That's Basundo. It's, 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 yeah. 
I'm going to I'm going to talk like this now for a while. Get right on the mic. Okay. Uh and the other thing I wanted to talk about, we mentioned it very briefly at the end of last episode. Uh but our good friend and founding sponsor Leanne Hart has put out her book. She's been talking about it for a while. She's been in the editing process and guess what? You can get her book right now on the Amazon. It's called Loving Rosenfeld by Leanne Hart. You can pick it up on Kindle or on paperback. Go get it. And uh I as somebody who has done exactly this a couple of times, it is a ridiculous accomplishment. Uh, so congratulations, Leanne. And Keith, That's I fantastic. believe that this particular novel is your precise oeuvre that you really, really uh, tend to gravitate towards. I, I haven't actually read it yet, but I will. Uh, there's there's a coffee and a book on the cover of the book. So, And, and that's uh, what it's about, Keith. You should know going in. It's about books and coffee. So you'll just books you'll, and you'll love it, man. Excellent. All right. Well, check it out, guys. Uh, congratulations, Leanne. That is a huge accomplishment. Yeah, uh, awesome. I, it, it, and and getting a, getting it across the finish line is really so hard. <laughs> I mean, it is the the editing. I mean, I mean, the obviously just writing an entire novel is 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 a lot. But like the editing process, the finishing process, the getting all of that done. So congratulations. Check it out, folks. While you're at it, check out my new book. The Farmer and the Two-Faced Lord, a picture book for adults with a very bleak and dark and horrible ending. Uh, you can also get it on Amazon. Just search for my name, Keith Farney, The Farmer and the Two-Faced Lord. Uh, Jillian's, I, I, I'm editing a sort of reading rainbow version of it. Okay. It's a picture book, so we have all the pictures. And I showed Jillian the first draft of that, and she's like, uh, this book makes the world a worse place. So... Well, that's a blurb for the front cover if I've ever seen one. I know. So just think about that. My own wife, to me, said this book makes the world a worse place to live in. And I am so proud. That's exactly what I was hoping for. That is the review I'm looking for. So if that doesn't make you curious, I don't know what will. All right. Well, moving forward into filings and subpoenas, uh, we've heard from some old friends, some new friends, some Old, old friends. But yes. let's start with our moderator, of course, of, of course, of course, Phoenix Cage, who is talking about last episode, uh, The Confession, which we both really enjoyed. He says, the three of us definitely agree on this wow. episode. Wow. My, I, I don't think we've ever agreed, all three of us, on anything ever in all of space and time. Until now. Uh, but he's... Until now. But he says, my reasons are that it didn't focus on the morality of this case, but rather the broader ethics of the law. Meanwhile, it developed the relationships of the characters using the tension created by the case. Mm -hmm. It had an A story so good, it didn't need a B story. So you can't argue that the B... Does that keep going? All right, well... Weird. I, I can't expand it. But well, that's that's all Phoenix had to say. He didn't have to say anything. I'm just gonna pretend he didn't say anymore. He also said, in undergrad, my focus was psychology and philosophy. Two of my finals were long papers on the subject of identity. Mike, you're making recommendations in and of itself. You really know your audience. Uh, so I will have to uh check that out myself. And uh yeah, so we and we talked about the uh the Star Trek gig. And then we talked um, about video games a bit. And we talked about video games and VR for a bit. We also heard from founding sponsor and old friend, wait for it, Cloud Lover 69 has appeared out of the clouds. We've been, and, wait, uh, we've been, we've been here for you all along, buddy. I, I Yeah. Uh, and here is what Cloud Lover 69 said. Hello, Mike and Key. I think you meant Keith, but if not, I'll, I'll take it. I've been busy in real life things, so unfortunately, I haven't been able to be an active member of the jury. I respect the converse, the conversion of the weather segment to back in time true crime or whatever it needs to be in these trying times. <laughs> I will always fully support Mike's genius. However, I would also like to recognize the genius of fellow founding sponsor Jorge Novoa. Pending approval from CEO Jen, I would like to give my seat on the Oopsie Board of Directors to Mr. Novoa, best cloud lover 69. Jorge, look at that. We, One of our founding sponsors is offering 
uh, you a seat on the board. Now, I, I, we'll have to discuss, you know, how, how we do our board thing, but I feel like maybe we could just get an extra chair. Yeah, I mean, to, to be frank, and, and look, I said it in my response, and, and real quick before I go back into pastiche, uh, you know, there's a lot of real life happening all around. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, sure whether it's small or whether it's large, whatever it is, uh, just know we are we are on your side. We're on your team. Always will be. We're always going to be here to uh, make fun and to have fun. So you're always welcome back. Um, um, so good, you know, best of luck and best wishes with whatever's going on. Hopefully there's some good news, too. Um that set well, aside. He, he just said that, or he, or 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 she, or they said there are things because we we don't know how yeah. Cloud Lover identifies. Uh, that that there are things going on in real life. Who knows? It could be good things. You just just be. I think that says <laughs> that explains both of our psychology that we assumed that something terrible was happening. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. The clouds, the clouds will clear. <laughs> <laughs> the clouds. It, it might be like in space. You might be an astronaut doing something awesome. That's but. true. Um, <laughs> the other thing I'll say uh, is that, look, we are so thankful for all of our sponsors and those who who, uh, who have given us one-time donations, monthly donations. We were able to pay our Hulu and um, some of our YouTube TV. And uh, But there are a few enough that I don't think we've uh, even capped our board yet. So I don't know that we have to promote anyone. I think basically anyone yeah. who has ever hit play is on the board. I, I think our, our 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 board table is like the table in Citizen Kane. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, past the salt and you have to like walk 20 feet past empty chairs. So we there's room, guys. There is room. Yeah, come aboard. Come board. aboard. In fact, if you would like to be on the board, uh, we, oh, can, here it is. we can show you just how to do that, can't we? Yes. Well, yeah. First off, you can contact us by emailing out of practice podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at out of practice podcast. You can also find our blog at out of practice podcast.blogspot.com. And uh, you can also do us a huge favor. Huge favor. If you're not going to join the board, at least join the jury. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else. That is the number one thing that helps us grow our subscriber base. So there it is. All right. Well, folks, that has been Filing and Subpoenas. Thank you so much for reaching out, everybody. And it is time now to hop back into the time machine. And we are going all the way back to April 22nd, the year 2001. And it makes me wonder what was going on. We stay in the basement. April 22nd. Yes. Uh, oof. Uh, uh, you know, there was some stuff happening. Um, but I was also rehearsing a play, and uh, it was going well. We were about to open. Uh no, I guess we were still about a month from opening. We opened, no, you know what? We opened now. It was running for a few weeks before my, my dad passed away. So uh, let's just take, I'll take this opportunity this week to say we were opening tribute uh, in, at the Dutch Country Players in Pennsylvania, which I think is still a thing that's happening. So uh, shout out to the Dutch Country Players. And uh, it was my first play that I'd ever been a uh, part of professionally, and uh, it was uh, a heck of a good time. So... Uh, this was also the first time in my life I had ever watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer because I was, uh, I had befriended a, a a a girl who was introducing me to Buffy, uh, as I didn't like going home. Uh, as I think I mentioned, my uh, days were full of getting yeah getting up early, uh, doing life stuff, going to work, then doing more life stuff, then going back to work, and then my evenings after play rehearsal were for me, and so I was just hanging out with this girl, and uh, she was smoking pot, and we were watching Buffy. So, yeah, so, there you go. Do you happen to remember which episode you watched first or what season or what was happening in the general Buffyverse at that point? Um, no, uh, I do remember. So we watched G.I. Jane, not G.I. Jane, uh, Tank Girl first. Uh, that was the first oh. thing we did together. And then she was like, I'm really into Buffy. I was like, oh, cool. I never really watched. So I all I remember, and to be honest, I've never gone back and really watched Buffy again, but I do remember the character Giles and how awesome I thought Giles was, is all I really recall. Oh, well, I mean, first off, Laurie Petty, awesome. She's she's a character. Uh, but do you know that Giles is the brother 
of uh, the guy who was uh, saying the, I think it was the Russian in the original Broadway cast of Chess. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, they're both they're both like super musical folks. And and uh, hold on, let me let me just let me just get his name correct because we're we are the better podcast here. Um, his name, of course, is Anthony Held. Yeah, I was right. Anthony Head, not Anthony Held. Yeah, that, yeah, that's different. what was. Yeah. I, I got nervous because <laughs> I was confusing Anthony Held and Anthony Head. Uh, yeah, his brother, I think, uh, forget what's his name, but but uh, Murray Head was the was in the original Broadway cast of Chess. Of course, if you're a big uh, musical theater nerd, you know that. And Anthony Head was also in Repo, the genetic opera. The uh, yeah, Repo, the genetic opera, which was like this horror movie opera. Right. It's unbelievable. It's cr- it's bonkers with Sarah Brightman okay. and such. It is it is horrifying, but fascinating. So definitely uh, give that a check out if you're in a weird mood. Oh, All right, Keith, right. let's okay. talk about you, buddy. Yeah, so I, I've been off on tangents. I'm, 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 I'm too many screens open. I'm looking confused. I'm on tangents. I've been there. But, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because this week on The Basement is, as I teased last week, was my junior recital at Eastman. And uh, I've done a lot of things be- while researching this. I found the old recordings of that recital. And uh, I I listened to as much of it as I could bear, which was not a that's great tough. deal. Yeah, that's rough. It was tough. And I and and here we'll we'll put up some pictures from that recital. Uh, oh, Lord. So speaking of like <laughs> gi- Bobby's giant jackets, good Lord. I was a big fatty fatso. Uh, I still am. <laughs> I had a brief moment where I wasn't. But as I was listening to uh, the recital itself, I was really struck by the fact that I could hear in the performance, how much I didn't want to be there, which was really an odd thing to to note about yourself. Because I I wasn't ready to do this. I wasn't ready to do this music. My heart wasn't in it, and I. It, it's almost like you're listening to a recital of somebody with a gun to their head, which is a weird thing to do. Because I, I, you know, I love music and I love singing, and I and I just profoundly love this whole thing, but I just, I just was not, I just didn't sound good. I wasn't happy. And uh, yeah, so there it is. But that well, was- Well, since uh, we, we haven't blurred his face, shall we give a, shall we shout out to the, the accompanist there? Oh, that's Chapel Kingsland, who was my, uh, my second accompanist at school after the, uh, <laughs> the woman who is now a world famous opera singer <laughs> broke up with me, sort of, <laughs> uh, which we told the story about before. Yeah, so it, I don't know. Like it was, it it made me a little melancholy this week going back and um, listening to this because well, you're, I'm a like, young, you're a young man. You know, there are two times in my professional career, or in my career, I'll say that I agreed to do something that I. I I later regretted and generally I think you and I can both attest to this is generally when you um, when that happens but you've already committed you still give it you know part of being a professional is you give it the old college try you you don't want to be there you you don't like whatever it is or whatever for whatever the case may be but you still you give it everything you got Uh, but this one time I got myself into something that was just just really embarrassing and bad and Mm. I uh my friend and I, who was, who was also part of it with me, I won't even mention my friend's name, kind of got a little drunk before the performance. Uh, mm. And this was a paid gig in front of people. And I just, I phoned her in. And and the the thing that sucks the most is that it, it has found its way to YouTube. So, you know, you can get there. It's You got to backdoor yourself oh. to the video. But there's a video of me just like not being a professional. and And I regret it. I regret it. So, you yeah. know, difference being there, Keith, is that, you know, 
it's it's not it's we've put it on the internet now um <laughs> but uh well, at, you weren't a pro you know what i mean you were just well, they're life lessons no well and, and i don't regret having gone to that school and oh, no. i don't i don't i don't really regret having done that it's just that I wouldn't change it today. Okay. If I had another shot when I was 18, I might have done taken a different path. I think mm-hmm. it was just one of those things where I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it more, but it was like I ended up there because I could be mm-hmm. as opposed to because I wanted to be. I got you. And and uh anyway, so it, it, yeah, it's just I I'd love to do it again now when I could enjoy it because I, I think if I, if I could go, because I was, I was literally thinking I played through some of the old stuff from that. And I'm like, a, I can sing it now, which is really fun. And, but I don't, and I don't remember any of the languages, that kind of stuff, but I, I wish I could today go and have those voice lessons and work on that rep again, but not for a reason, not to be judged, not to make a career in it, but just for the, for the fun of it because if i were doing it for the fun of it i think it would be fun as opposed to like oh god i have to like become an opera singer blah 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 blah. it was it was weird it's one of the all reasons right. i lobby that most most not all uh most kids should have to take two to three years before they go to college like you just yeah. aren't you're not fully baked yet and you're not getting out of it what what you're paying for it uh, uh, unquestionably yeah no i i wish i'd taken a year or two like there was there was no hurry like and and I would be I would have been much more ready for it emotionally physically I mean when you're 18 as a singer like you're just your yeah. instrument isn't developed yet and so you're I'm literally still in puberty for God's sake actually sakes, biologically right this is basically now you've it's only the past 5 years you've really you're really ready to yeah. your voice is Oh yeah no baked. I mean the for 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 classical right? singing, yeah, classical singing, your prime is like thirty to forty five. So Keith, I'm, I'm, Keith? I'm, what I'm doing right here is wasting my prime talking on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we should segue out of here. We're, We're just gonna regret our life again. About. <laughs> It's time for the Out of Practice Podcast's This Day in the World. The greatest hits, the biggest movies, headlines from Vermont, essential sports updates, and for some inexplicable reason, the weather from 20 years ago. Now back to Keith and Mike. Okay, folks, we are talking about April 22nd, the year 2001. And the number one song was All For You by Janet Jackson. The top movie was Bridget Jones' Diary, which took over the first place in its second week because it was a sleeper hit. It was not first place its first week, but there it was. The Burlington Free Press talked about 30,000 people protesting the free trade pact in Quebec. This now that's video, a jam. Now this is a jam. This cover is so hilarious. If you're... I'll put it out. It is. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes because this person covering it got their all of their ridiculous musical theater friends to f- stupid dance behind oh, the video, no. and it is ridiculously like funny. like on purpose. Like, like on purpose. Okay. It, it basically like if you and I and Jen and Jillian were like, okay, I want you to '80s dance, but like do the best you can. <laughs> Which will be hilarious. <laughs> that was like, me during the uh, the Super Bowl halftime show last night. Uh, we were on camera with a couple friends, and they had kids, and the kids were big fans of the weekend, so they wanted to have a dance party. So I, you know me, Keith, I'm not oh, going to yeah. give you 25%. I went no. for it. And uh, I don't know that I'm going to be getting out of this chair anytime soon. Yeah, so how much Advil did you have after halftime? Uh, enough. That and some uh, some Hay- Basil Hayden. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for that. Coming up next is everybody's favorite segment entitled It's time it's time, time, it's time it's time for sports. Sports, sports, sports. My beloved at the time of Philadelphia Flyers were in 
Game six of the first round of the Stanley Cup Flyers against the hated rival Buffalo Sabres. So I'm just going to set this up. It is the Flyers. We were in the Stanley Cup Finals last year against the hated rival Buffalo Sabres. We won game five. All we need to do is win game six to force a game seven and continue this terrific season. I was pumped. This is what happened. That's one nothing Buffalo. <laughs> That's two nothing Buffalo. Oh no. That's three nothing Buffalo. Oh boy. That's four nothing Buffalo. Oh boy. There's more. People are very excited at least. Well, we're in Buffalo. Oh. Oh, come on, Philly. No. That's five nothing Buffalo. Oof. Yikes. <laughs> no, is it keep going? Oh yeah. It's six nothing Buffalo. Wow, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, and there's more. Okay. Yeah. It's seven nothing <laughs> Buffalo. I don't know that he even tried to stop that. Who was who was in goal? I think it was Roman Czechmonic to begin with, but I think that might be Brian Boucher. Yeah, they just called you in. Keith is now in Keith's it's in the net. Eight, eight. nothing <laughs> Buffalo. What game is this again? This is game six. Oh, this boy. is this eliminated us. Well, I mean, if you're gonna go out, eight eight, eight oh is Brian not Boucher. a bad way. Eight oh is oh, not a bad way. My, I think that was an afternoon game, and I remember Ooh. that really well because I was so into it, and I just I every game that entire series had been tight, had been like overtime battle, 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 battle. We won game five. We were alive and just an epic shitting of the bed. For those of you who are not hockey fans, like usually a team scores three or four goals uh, to win the game. And then like a high scoring game gets up to five. Like it, you don't see a team score eight goals hardly ever. And in the playoffs, come on. So that was a, a bit anticlimactic to the end of the Philadelphia Flyers series and season. Okay, it is now time. I'm a human being, God damn it! My life has value, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! It's time to talk about the damn episode! Well, you know, we almost timed that. We it timed it close. really close. It pretty I'm, close. I'm pretty impressed. We got it perfectly last week, so I know we can oh. do it. I just need just a little more indication. Yeah, okay. All right, I, I will I will indicate harder. But thus far, Keith, nothing's fucked up, which means the oopsies should be a hot fucking mess. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, we find out what's broken we don't know about. That's right. really the... Uh... How much did Mike do at 11 a.m. that uh, <laughs> prep work? <laughs> Spoiler alert, okay. not, a, not a ton. No. So we are, again, uh, talking about Season 5, Episode 19, entitled Home of the Brave. Now... Sit down, get comfortable. Let's talk about who wrote this. Okay. It was written the teleplay by David E. Kelly, Lynn E. Little, Adam Armas, and Nora K. Foster, with a story by David E. Kelly, Lynn E. Litt, Adam Armas, Nora K. Foster, and Mark Guggenheim. So there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. And it was directed by Keith Samples, who last directed Death Penalties. Which leaves us with one more thing to do. What is that supposed to mean? What's your problem? Is this what happens to women when you insert your penis? What? What? What does Mike think's gonna happen? Yeah, what if he would have drank the curdled milk? Then what would have happened? You know, yesterday, Keith, 
we had curdled milk. And uh, Jen was like, what's all this white stuff floating in the coffee while we're like, oh, God. Oh, that's not good. And do you know what CEO Jen did, Keith? Because I was I was working. This wasn't yesterday. This was Friday? Doesn't matter when. Not part of, not pertinent mm-hmm. to the story. But I was working. Yeah. And she went out in the inclement weather and drove and got more cream so we could have coffee together. God damn. She... I think Jen might be the nicest person any of us know. The to say one... that like she's nicer than you or me is ridiculously obvious, but she is just profoundly one of the nicest people I've ever met. Without uh, almost every time that I introduce her to a new person or a new friend or somebody who hasn't met her yet, and <clears throat> she's no longer there, the first question I get every time is always, "She's that's she's not really like that all the time, is she?" And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's her. Yeah. That's she's like that most of the time. I mean, I can, I'm as you may have, may or may not have guessed, I can be difficult. <clears throat> um, what? So, you know, <laughs> I can't imagine. It's it's not all. She sometimes has to defend herself. So uh, she does she does have uh, other degrees. Um, but you know, I know when when that when the kettle is uh, whistling because I'll, I I often will get a I will not. Be spoken to that way, and I'm like, whoop. That's when I know I pushed yeah, well, boundaries. Well, good for her. Yeah, damn right. Good for her. Yeah, you know, because uh, I I don't know if uh, people also know. I also ha- uh, have moments of being difficult. Hmm. I, Two peas in that little you, teeny pod. I want to get your shocked face. <laughs> 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 oh my god, we are two of the most uniquely difficult people in the world, but different. We are, yes. we are difficult in different ways. I'm more of like a uh, narcissist, linguistic bully bulldog. And, mm-hmm. and, and you're, how would you describe your difficulty? Um, I'm a lawyer. I will argue the other side of the coin, even if I don't agree with it or believe it, just to friggin' be a pain in the ass. Yeah, well, that, that, I'm a contrarian at times, I would say. Yeah, I, I will definitely go into the courtroom, but I will always believe it, whether it makes any sense or not. I I, I will be able to talk myself into believing it. So no. I, I would I, I'd be the good lawyer because I would be Bobby and I would always talk myself into thinking that my client was innocent, even though they were blatantly guilty. Though, Keith, I think today we talked about it a little bit off air, so I won't I won't relitigate it, but you know, you and I also are but to, to our counterpoint is we're also very fiercely loyal people. So we we, we reward are. loyalty and we are loyal and uh, we surround ourselves with those type of people, which is difficult to find in our small little circle of business. So uh, it's not all it's not all bad. No, it's mostly no, no. bad. It's mostly no, bad. We're, I, look, we're 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 great people, but we're we're difficult sometimes. Yes. That's all. Okay, uh, what were we doing? Oh, you're going to tell me what happens in this episode. Yeah, so I think that the uh, sheer uh, quantity of creatives on this episode is indicative of the fact uh, that the previously on, which I watched this week, um, and it was a it was a doozy. It was like a minute and a half previously on, is bringing back to the forefront a variety of through lines that we've had. So we've got. Does everyone remember that Lucy was a, uh, a rape crisis counselor? Because that's back, apparently. Right. Um, does everyone remember when uh, Eugene was in a buddy cop show with Ernie Sabella? Because yes. that's coming back. And there's one other thing uh, in the previously on that I've forgotten, but it's coming back. And so I think that in order to merge these three storylines, they probably had to bring back into the fold the folks who were working on those storylines, would be my guess. That makes a lot of sense. Um, how we're going to, I would, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to think that we're going to have just have multiple stories going because Mm -hmm. to, to somehow merge a Lucy as a rape counselor, crisis counselor and Ernie Sabella's like generally general comedic appearances. Yeah. That's that's a bit of a tone shock. Yeah. Yeah. Though he was sad puppy at the last one. I mean, it, they, it is a sad kind of tale. Oh, he's, oh, he's heartbreaking, yeah. Um, and let's not also forget, this wasn't mentioned, but we do now have bad guy Helen back. So let's right. not forget that from last week. So anyway, I, it's the, it's the, we're coming up 
to the close of the season of Big Swings, so I don't want to yeah. let us anybody down. Um, this will be the last appearance of Ernie Sabella on the practice because somehow, somewhere, some why, Ernie get dead. Oh shit! Ernie get wow, dead. Wow, you're gonna kill off Ernie Sabella? What kind of a monster are you? It's look. That's why they needed such a huge team in order to craft a deft narrative in order to murder Ernie Sabella. Uh, big they swing, needed a big kids, team. Big swing. Hey, y'all asked for it. You got it. Okay. Wow, you're gonna kill Pumbaa? <laughs> you're a monster. Hey. You you it's, heard it's it here it, first. Mike and Deglio killed Pumbaa. He deserved it. You know what I mean? You fart that much. Some at some point somebody's gotta get pissed off. Oh, then no one in this house would be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Not after that dark chocolate chili, let me tell you. Woo! Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. That's after last Super Bowl, like we we held it in and then we were able to fly home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Well, if you would like to listen to us, listen to the episode, then you should hop over to uh, hop over to your <laughs> podcasting service of choice, and we will see you back here for the oopsies. And we are back, baby. Yes, we are. Woo, that was uh, that was an episode. Yes, and it was. Uh, just you know, just in case you don't remember what happened, it's my favorite segment. Mike has 30 seconds to remember what just happened on the show. Well, y'all, uh, everybody's pissed. Uh, a young woman was raped blatantly, uh, but guess what? They put her on the stand. They don't make her go see the Mikes or the Bobs, and uh, it turns out they use Lucy against her, and she, uh, the rapist walks off, and then we sort of mansplain it in a weird way. Uh, this other guy gets deported because his brother wants to kill his mom, and then Harlan Bassett does something right and uh, elicits Eugene to help him out in a case that hopefully we'll see more of next week. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, there it is. Yeah, no comedy, All but right. that was just the straight up and down. No, that's that's just, that, this, that, that is what happened. Uh, well, you know, sometimes uh, it's that, that kind of episode. But no matter what kind of episode it is, it is always going to end with the very important... Ladies and gentlemen, the Out of Practice Podcast, in unofficial, unsolicited, unfactual association with David E. Kelly Productions, proudly present... Oopsie! The Oopsies! Celebrating excellence in acting good, lawyering good, guesting good, and being Tom Brady. Not to mention, this is where we rate the episode and stuff. Now... Here are your hosts, Keith and Mike. What the hell are the oopsies? Well, they're a fake award show that we do every week that begins with... Most Valuable! Listen... You know what? I was gonna try to I was gonna go down a dark hole about how really Helen put together an incredible case and and litigated that I thought just the best way she could. Uh, but I think we're gonna talk more about that case later. So I think I'm gonna take this opportunity to, to say that I think the most valuable lawyer here is probably Harlan Bassett, right? Because he did what needed to be done to get his client the best representation moving forward. He knew they weren't gonna settle, and so he We'll say manipulated, but you could also say uh, theatrically convinced Eugene and and a firm that has a great track record at these types of cases to jump on board and help. Yeah, I I I agree with you. Um, I I think I mean it wasn't quite lawyering, but it was in the lawyer arena convincing. Uh, uh, he was a lawyer while he did it. So, yeah, I'll <laughs> give it to you. It was related to the case. Uh, so yeah, no, I agree. I think it is Harland for all of those reasons, you know, and in terms of Helen, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about it. I think that she made a lot of good pieces of doing, of trying a good case there, but I, I fault her for this. And that is, she sort of surrendered mm -hmm. to the attitudes of the era which allowed there to be 
all of this weird uh, victim blaming, vi- victim doubting pushback. And the Helen we know and love, the Helen who would murder somebody, should have fought way harder on all of those elements, defended Lucy harder, defended her uh, the, uh, the, pro- the, the, the victim harder, should have gone after the defendant harder. And, you know, again, we're, we're judging this based on what makes it into the episode. But, like, why isn't she bringing in other people that this guy may or may not have assaulted? Why, are, why is she not eviscerating this guy? And uh, I feel like she at least what we saw of her on this case, she made some really good points. She played some of it really well, but I want to see Helen like ripping some guy's throat out with her teeth in this case. And we, and she kind of was like, eh, there's not much we can do. Yeah. And, and though you're right, we, there's a lot we didn't see on camera, but what we do see at least at one point is even though it was dramatically enhanced after the one woman who we, who they gave us zero context about, right goes on uh and says that Lucy quote unquote co- coerced her to uh claim rape Lucy stands up in the middle of court and is like yo we should go back at her let me put call yeah. me back up let's refute that and and Helen just concedes and that i think yeah, she's is like, yeah and that was absolutely to the detriment of the case because they could have at least gone back and 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 at least yeah, like highlighted tried. yeah yeah she like she i think Helen punted on third down in this that, case, a lot. And, and, and that's just the litigation, right? Like, let's not even right. talk about the sort of, what a shitty friend. Her sort of, her boomeranging it back in Lucy's face at the end is a, just a shitty friend. Well, and it, it, and honestly, like, and we'll, we'll get to it at the end, yeah. but it, it felt very shoehorned in by the male writers. It didn't feel like the, like, didn't feel like the characters, either one of those characters were actually saying any of that. It, it felt very much like they were puppets yeah, we'll, we'll for get the male to it. writers I have some defending themselves. About that. All right. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Because we, All right. we, we if, if nothing else, we defend women on this show. Well, we try not to be idiots. All right. It is time for, and limber up. Already famous because you've been on TV Getting a pay Watch check the first entry on your IMDb Way to go But you're the best guest actor You are the best guest actor You are the best guest actor on the episode Oh, it's the best part of my week right there Oh, truly Um... Ernie Sabella, great. Uh, yeah, we're gonna see him more. I, I, I suspect uh, Gary Cole, class act. But once again, as we often do, because you and I, I think everybody can 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 kind of understand. But specifically, having been in this business, you and I understand how difficult it is to play a victim in any sort of way. And I've never had to do anything remotely close to this. Um. Uh, the 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 victim of this case, who not only gave incredible testimony that was believable, but also when she lost, you got that sense of resignation from her. But also, you know, like in the context of of the time period, the sort of like not shocked that they lost. She didn't overdo it, and then recognized I should probably get the hell out of here. Like just a great performance overall by by Megan Henning. Megan Henning. So I, I think if nothing else, she needs a, an Instagram shout out from us. So uh, that's uh, my oopsie award for this week. Yeah, no, I, it, it's Megan Henning hands down. Like to to come in as a relatively unknown actress and be given that scene and be able to do that, you know, because when you're shooting something like that, that may be the first thing they shot. They might have just like walked in, did her hair, throw her on the stand and like spit tears. And and to be and to be able to do that under those circumstances, it's it's incredible work, and and you can see why, as I mentioned before, David E. Kelly was like, she's great. I'm gonna make her, um, you know, like she's gonna be a big part of my next show, uh, which she was. Sadly, it did not last. But yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, congrats to Megan Henning on your best guest actor award. Coming up next. You killed your podiatrist or blew the case But you let a single tear run down your face You're the best 
actor on the show. Uh. This one's a little trickier. Uh, Steve Harris, excellent, uh, though fairly one note this episode. I mean, they didn't give him a, a, a ton of stuff to do. Uh, Bobby is not in the episode. Uh, Lara Flynn is is really great, and I think she's totally up for consideration. But and and maybe I'm biased because I just I just I'm just just astounded by her work at especially this point in her career, as we've mentioned over and over again. I think Marla Sokoloff just is so good, and she's she is a she's a B player in this case in this episode, but yet. Even the reaction shots to her in 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 the trial, just watching what's happening, are so furtive and full of 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 context, of backstory, of active acting. Even when she's just being reactive, and you know, on set sometimes that's filmed asynchronously. Sometimes it's just really hard, and she's so good and. And and then that scene with Helen at the end, which once again we're going to come back to. She's even though it's like you said, maybe it wasn't what the actresses themselves would have brought to the table or suggested, but she's still internalizing it. That conflict is really, uh, it, like you said, it it fired us up. It made us actively angry, and I think that that is a part and parcel uh, to the performances. So I'm going to go with Marla on this episode. Yeah, no, I, I thought Kelly also did a good job um, in her although she was mainly just sort of reacting to what was happening as opposed to driving what was happening. But yeah, this is Marla's episode. I, th- I thought she did an excellent job. I love this development of the character because I was as I was watching this, I was thinking back to uh, season three, which is her first season on the show, and her first few episodes and like what the role she was. She was the snarky agitator in the office sort of behaving like a like a bratty teenager. And now this is very adult arc. She's grown a great deal. The character has grown a great deal. And it's allowed Marla to do much more serious and challenging work. And and I I really like that. And I, you know, because it it feels like a more mature character, but it's also a more mature show. And it's a it's a it's a character that has more confidence, but it's a show that has more confidence that doesn't doesn't feel like the need to rely on that like weird artificially manufactured conflict in the office and blah blah blah. So, uh, I I really like uh, Marla in this episode and this uh, growth of the character. All right, Ugh. a lot of unanimous choices. The Tom here. Brady Award for being Tom Brady. I don't want to talk about it. Well, let's talk. Quickly about last week, that was Tom Brady's uniform caught in the trunk of a car as it speeds away Tom Brady, which, uh, <laughs> congratulations for fitting that all on the uh, the picture. I, 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 because I had that Coppertone ad like in the back of my head. I'm like, I, I, that's the only thing I could think of. I couldn't find any pictures of his jersey being torn. So I, I did what I could. I like it. And this week, Keith, we're not talking about it, but let's say that I, just to make you Photoshop it, this week is a little different twist. This week's winner for the Tom Brady for being Tom Brady is Mike and Keith being crushed under the weight of Tom Brady and his seven Lombardi trophies. <laughs> uh, fine. So, we don't have to concede uh, yeah. that he's the greatest, but uh, we are being crushed under the weight of that realization. Yeah, 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 Tom Brady, Tom Brady, blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to announce how many spare tires this episode gets. As an aside, uh, this would be the time, if there was ever a time, Keith, to retire the Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady after he uh, put together that show last night. But <laughs> for the sake of commitment, that will not be the case. <laughs> but we said we're loyal to a fault. This this is not news. Um, you know, generally I'd go to our one shots here, but I'd like to have a little bit of a conversation with you here, Keith. First things first, let's go back to the very beginning of the pod this week. When you listed off those 37 writers, uh, how many of them were women? That is a good question. It it was actually evenly split. Okay. So you had Lynn E. Litt and Nora K. Foster were both on the uh, the story. Yeah. So like I said earlier, when I was like just giggling over how much I like this show and this episode was was doing all the things we like, right? It wasn't being too over uh, over dramaed, uh, right? It was a great case, and it was two cases that I thought were just going to touch on really interesting issues, the sort of uh, victim shaming and 
and uh, home court advantage, uh, to coin a sports ball phrase, that goes to the uh, accused rapists in generally in these cases versus, yeah. uh, you know, dreamers and or deportation and or, you know, and we sort of, um, uh, and both were handled well. I mean, the acting was great, right? Um, and both the premises were interesting, but this is one where they sort of fumbled it, in my opinion, on both on both sides. So let me get let me get the B case out of the way first. Like, really interesting. Here's this brother who uh, is. It turns out the brother was the murderer, and that's why the guy kid won't talk, and that's why he and and Jason Kravitz came in, and it, it just seemed like a lot of smoke and mirrors. To like, there was no payoff, right? There's just no payoff. Well, I, I I thought the the last piece of it, which was uh, the fact that the brother would kill his own mother, it it, it felt really tacked on. It felt really incongruous with the whole rest of the story and these characters. And it it felt like the in the writers' room, they're like, we have to find a way to lose this. Like mm. we we want. Uh, like we want to to actually deport him and we want to sort of feel the emotional weight of that loss, which I, I completely agree with. I think that's exactly how they should have ended it. But they couldn't find a reason not to have him just testify against his brother. And like his, his brother murdered somebody. Like what they, they, need, they felt like they needed a better reason for him not to flip on them. So they tacked on this weird thing about the brother killing the mother for some like why wouldn't the brother just kill him <laughs> like what is the weird it, it felt very like oh like midnight we need a solution in the writer's room kind of a thing now moving on to the other case i know we both are in agreement and let me first look i'll concede that there is an interesting conversation uh about the role can can the, uh, a, a rape crisis counselor influence a, 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 a victim? C can does a, a a defense? Well, the first my first problem is that if, I think it's a false equivalency with with Helen saying, "Well, you know, often I'm so motivated to convict a client that I I push right. to." That is a false equivalency to you were raped in the past and you're so passionate that, or you were assaulted in the past and you're so passionate that you you maybe are coloring these women's thoughts about whether they're victims or not. But that discounts the whole point of like, these women have chosen to see a rape crisis counselor. So they are well, already they are already contemplating their victimhood and to think that Lucy somehow puts them over the edge, which somehow right. gains credence to the uh, es the innocence of this man is, and that that and that consent is such a uh, a delicate flower that it that it can turn on a dime. It's so like ambiguous, that. yeah. Right. It 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 just is just some bullshit, and I don't think it's just twenty years of evolution, Keith. On the, I just think it was a fumbled ball from the get, and I can't yep. believe that that somehow this nobody called them on it. In the writing, well, in, in in the production of it, yeah, yeah, and, and which makes me think that the opposite happened. That uh, I I I think, you know, I I I I think there is a world in which, and I have no reason to believe this, but I I think there is the first draft of this did not include that conversation because everything else. In the episode, the music, the writing, the performances, how Gary Cole, like, because if you look at the direction of it, right, the way Gary Cole is performing it, the music that plays when uh, when he's talking, when the case got adjudicated, the way we're, we're framing and the music that's playing when Lucy's talking, all of it, all of it, and which is why I, w I was so thrown by this conversation because all of the storytelling leading up to that moment was telling a completely different story than that moment did. So I'm wondering if somewhere along the way, they got a network note or somebody got cold feet or somebody had a bug up their ass. It, like that scene could have been like filmed a week later, honestly, mm -hmm. because it, 
it felt so tacked on and so undercutting everything. They were scared of this episode for some reason, so they felt like they had to throw doubt on it. Well, that's the biggest crime of it. The biggest crime is that it changes two things. It radically changes the episode morally, right? The moral center, the nugget, the takeaway, whatever you want to call it. It radically changes that, I think. Maybe maybe someone will argue differently. Please write in. I think. And additionally, it, it throws such a wrench into the arc of Lucy as a character. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, yeah. not only the victim and such. I mean, that's uh, that's part and parcel with what we're saying about the the whole moral of the story. But but Lucy, who's doing yeoman's work. I mean, it ain't like she's she's got a full time job and she's yeah. doing this great service and yet and has been a victim herself. And and now she's being sort of shamed. It's a shitty thing to do to both of the characters. Honestly. Oh yeah. Because yeah. up up until that point, Helen was nobly fighting for the right thing. You know, and and as as you said, and I think you said it well, that there is a story to tell about the res- the responsibilities of objectivity of people in these situations. You know, if you're a therapist, if you're a if you're a counselor, it, it, you know, yes, of course, you don't want to lead people to things that aren't true. And there's a story to be told about that, and that is and that is an interesting story, and that's a that's a complex story, and and that is a valid story to explore. But this is that's not what this episode was about. No. Th- th- this episode was not about that at all. That was just tagged on at the end, doubting victims, doubting the people, helping the victims, and putting into, uh, you know, uh, this whole episode about consent and about consent being unambiguous this little tag here says, oh, wait, no, actually consent is really ambiguous, as is your motives, as is all of this. It it was really ugly to, to end the episode undercutting not only the, the rest of the episode, but the very idea of consent. And it, it, it was just, I, I was so mad because I was really on board with this episode. I wrote down, wow, this episode could have been shot today. Like this, and then that's what you do at the end of that. And I don't know who made that happen, whether that was David E. Kelly or with somebody else, but David E. Kelly should not have allowed that to happen. And it's just shitty. You know, unless, unless, you know, and and we have the uh we have the benefit of of knowing or somewhat, if they were gonna come back, right? It was gonna come back and be like a we were going to revisit this, and I don't know that that would have salvaged it, but at least we could have like refound, re- re- recalibrated our moral center. But I, I don't suspect that's going to happen, as it's clear we have other fish to fry with with Ernie and and stuff. Um, we only yeah, have a couple well, episodes I'm, I'm left in the season. I'm excited about that part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm excited about the Ernie part, mm-hmm. I, and I w- I would have you know, and we should give out some tires and move on with our day. But I think I would have given this three tires higher. I was ex- I was expecting to give this a very good rating. I, yeah, was, I really like this episode. High eights for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, uh, but I, like I said, I don't know that I'm going to ding it as much as that sounds like you might. But I'm going to go in with uh, it's gone from probably like an eight seven something like that down to I'm going to give it a seven point one two. Yeah, yeah, and I I feel this the same way. The thing that this show their Achilles heel is consent. When I really think mm-hmm. about cuz cuz like what was what is the worst episode of the series? Sex lies and monkeys. And and how Kelly was raped and how she dealt with it and how people around her dealt with it and how the show dealt with it. And this is the second time where the show has really not just fumbled on the one yard line, like dropped the ball, pulled their pants down and taken a shit on the one yard line. And and I I think the, I, I don't know. Is it David E. Kelly? Is it someone else? Like, I don't understand why the show struggles with the concept of consent. Uh, so therefore, I give this a 5.1 spare tires. It would have been an 8.1, but you get a 5.81 because you fucked it up at the end. Okay. <laughs> Not that I'm pissed about it, but I'm pissed about it. Yeah, I think you should be. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Well, if you would like to uh, also be pissed about it or be pissed at me for being pissed about it, you can email us at outofpracticepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at 
Out of Practice Podcast. You can look at our blog and see how all these rankings stack up at outofpracticepodcast.blogspot.com. You can do us a huge favor and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other service. Join the jury. It really helps. The Out of Practice Podcast is brought to you by generous donations from Leanne Wrights. Go buy her book. Cloud Lover 69 trying to give the seat to Jorge, but we're going to give them both a seat, Jorge Novoa and, of course, Jennifer Masanova. You can join them, guys. Uh, and I only got 30 <laughs> seconds to tell you about it. It was so close, Keith. We were so close to it working out. Uh, happens to the best of us. Anyway, uh, Keith, tell us real quick, what's this all about? Well, that was the Brotherhood of Poland, New Hampshire. It got canceled. That was the uh, show. Yes, yes. Well, you know what's not getting canceled? The 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 bromance between Sabella and uh, Eugene. So, Keith, you'll always be the Pumbaa to my Timon. And so we'll shoot off some Hakuna laser sounds. <laughs> Hakuna laser sounds.